Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so it's a great privilege and honor to be part of this fantastic e-conference organized by IASR. Uh, I have been given 30 minutes, which starts at 12.15 uh, for this particular presentation. So while uh, when I was asked about uh, uh, a topic to be chosen for this uh, conference uh, of digital, digital forensics, I decided to choose a subtopic of digital forensics. Uh, that is browser forensics and then i thought of like discussing uh, and deliberating upon uh, various things which i have experienced while doing digital forensics in the field uh, so when i say when i say digital forensics and its subtopics uh, i guess many of my uh, uh, previous speakers they have wonderfully spoken about uh, the macro understanding of digital forensics such as the challenges therein and the future of digital forensics uh, uh, but when it comes to when it comes to the groundwork, digital forensics is divided into further subtopics. So browser forensics is one of them. We can also have topics like registry forensics. Sorry, we can also have topics like registry forensics, event log analysis, RAM analysis, file system analysis, or file system forensics, or or, or Mr. Samir was pointing pointing towards network forensics email investigation and so on and so forth right and based upon the the type of case which we receive either in the law enforcement community or in the industry uh, industry investigation uh, we decide to employ uh, uh, the, one of these uh, uh, one of these investigation techniques to fulfill our objective right and this presentation is going to be about browser forensics and if we can if we can further deliberate into it all right. Uh, the agenda is going to be very simple. Uh, so normally, when I when I do my presentation, I try to do it according to the audience I am facing. But then I was told that the audience could be from the law enforcement, from the student community, from the professional community as well. Some of them could be experienced. Some of them could be inexperienced as well. So I decided that uh, let us design a presentation, which is a kind of a balanced one, uh, not very technical in nature, not very easy to understand as well. <laughs> so let us let us quickly dis discuss about it. So let us first understand the scope and role of browser forensics for our investigations. So when I when I say investigation, I will be simultaneously referring to uh, both LA investigations as well as industry investigations. So in an industry investigation, we not normally call it incident response rather than investigation. We call those uh, uh, processes in incident response. And then once we have the basic understanding of browser forensics, let us understand some common browser artifacts. What exactly as an investigator we get from those uh, artifacts which are available into a system. For example, you are doing a forensics uh, in the laptop of Abhishek Kumar, which is who is using a Windows 10 laptop. What kind of artifacts we are going to get from there and whether 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 can we have something else which so far we have been missing so let's understand that all right and then uh, anything else and then the final conclusion Fair enough. so let us quickly talk about the scope and role of browser forensics for investigations or incident response so my first uh, mm, my first point of emphasis is that when when exactly browser forensic is performed so it is all it is all dependent upon what kind of investigations we have been doing but majority of the time the browser forensic is performed when we have a physical computer when we have a physical evidence in place for example a physical hard disk and then we image it and then so on and so forth that is mostly from the perspective of the law enforcement community. Although Dr. Umbir Singh just mentioned that we do live forensics as well. But most of the time, the browser forensics is done when we have a physical hard disk available to the law enforcement. Either they do it on the scene of crime or they will send it to the forensics laboratory. But when it comes to industry, industry has largely moved from this physical way of uh, acquisition to the to the to the live acquisition mode so to the live acquisition to the live acquisition wherein uh, wherein a forensic uh, forensic client such as the in case forensic client 
or the Chanium forensic client or Axiom forensic client, that actually helps us do the imaging from anywhere in the world, as long as the, both the machines, that is both the collector machine as well as both the, both the suspect machine is connected to the internet, uh, the live acquisition can be done over the internet. All right, that is, that is one thing. Uh, that is when one thing to understand when browser forensics is performed. Mm. All right. Uh, the second part, uh, which is uh, 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 which is important to inform here that browser forensics is not only about the browsing activity. Uh, this is what the normal uh, uh, normal way of perceiving browser forensics. Many times we have seen that even though when we navigate through the file system using the browser that also gets recorded and so many artifacts are recorded so just to give you an example if you go to my browser and say file and colon then it is going to to actually give me the file system here and then i can browse through it as 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 as, as and when i want it and then if i go through the history this is going to demonstrate that as well. So you can see here that uh, this history demonstrate that Abhishek has visited the file system here through the browser. So the point I want to want to emphasize here is that we also have a lot of artifacts related to the file system navigation through the browser. All right, with that, with that, let's understand the objective of browser forensics. So we understood about when the browser forensic is performed some some data about uh, apart from internet investigation we have file system navigation also recorded in browser and now let's understand the overall objective of browser forensics so as i previously mentioned the overall objective of browser forensics always depends upon what kind of investigations we have been doing and who is doing that investigation so it could be the leas or it could be the industry see lea i do not want to focus much upon without because it may reveal some information, but most of the time the LEA investigation will, to, to, will be revolve, revolve around normal, normal crimes, law and order situations, pornographic activities, financial crimes, money laundering, and so on and so forth. Those are the main objectives of LEAs for which uh, they intend to do browser forensics to find certain artifacts. When it comes to industry, uh, I think even though the tools and techniques are going to be the same, but the objectives widely vary in the industry. So for example, we are mostly concerned about, I mean, some people who are in industry, they're mostly concerned about browser forensics uh, in order to find out the source of the ransomware they, which they have received. For example, they might want to see if uh, the user clicked on any phishing link, or if the user accessed his web mail and then uh, he clicked on certain suspicious links there, or if could be detecting the phishing attempt on the organization and so on and so forth. So the point here is that the objectives of browser forensics for both the LEAs as the, and the industry could be widely varied, even though they mostly are going to use the same tools and technologies when it comes to doing the investigation. So like with that, with that uh, before I go forward, there is a limitation here uh, when it comes to fulfilling those objectives. And the, 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 the vast limitation here is that if we, have a, if we have a case where the browser history or majority of the browser artifacts are deleted, what could be the, what could be the possible course of action in that cases? Hmm. So, so uh, that is what I have observed that uh, there are two possible scenarios when it comes to deleting browser deleted browser history and how do we how do we get around it so one i have seen that uh, mostly for mostly for mostly for law enforcement that we go for something called data carving or carving huh, or browser artifacts carving hmm. uh, apart from certain other ways also i think one of the ways i'm going to discuss today here but carving is one of the major way uh, when we try and we try and retrieve the deleted artifacts but when it comes to the industry i think industry has again evolved uh, industry has evolved when it comes to deleted browsing history and most of the time this requirement of browsing history we no longer go and check the browser because the browsing history is available into something called the DNS logs and the DNS logs 
will be maintained by the browser maintained by the maintained by the industry maintained by the organization so for example if abhishek is using this computer which happens to be his official computer every single link or every single url he has to go through it will have to go through a proxy server and the proxy server does record every single browsing activity and that gets recorded into a dns slunk dn dns slot and as an investigator i'll fire my splunk splunk is basically a sim sim2 i'll write a query i'll write a simple query to find out all the logs belonging to abhishek kumar from this date to that date and i will be able to get all the browsing history all right so some some technical terms splunk and dns log nothing much to worry about it's some kind of logs where internet history is getting stored splunk is basically a tool which which extracts that internet history that's it all right so with uh, the scope let's see the next thing yes uh before we go forward before we go forward now let us spend a minute or two about uh, uh the 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 overall process in which uh, uh, the browser forensic is initiated so i think i discussed about it uh, in the first slide when i talked about uh, uh, tanium client or in case client and so on but let us deliberate it even further so in normal cases in normal cases of uh, digital forensics and not browser forensics uh, specifically in case of digital forensics what we need is the physical evidence in place so such as a hard disk or if we can image a hard disk or uh, remotely using using uh, clients like tanium in case and axiom once once we do the imaging once we do the imaging of the hard disk the next thing we have to do uh, uh, for browser forensic specifically is to find out the relevant databases and the files which are rel which are which are associated with browser forensic so just to give you an example just to give you an example so i have written somewhere the path here yes now just to give you an example here once the image is done imaging is done uh, using different tools it could be free tools like ftk imager it could be paid tools like in case in in case in point investigator and so on once the imaging is done what we normally do what we normally do is to extract the relevant databases and files which contains the browser artifacts now where that i mean where those files could be possibly located so in case of windows 10 and uh, uh, windows 10 and google chrome the path is this uh, so the investigator simply goes to this path and he copies he copies all the relevant files all the relevant databases which contain some browser browser artifacts we'll we'll surely come to the uh, the browser artifacts in the next slide but just to give you an example of how various steps are performed while we initiate the browser forensics so first thing we have to image a hard disk then we have to extract the uh the the relevant databases and files which contains the artifacts we'll come to the artifact in the next slide now the third thing which has been more prevalent in the industry or in even the law enforcement as well is to fire a tool is to fire a tool on the entire hard disk and let the tool do the job for you let the tool do the maximum job for you and then our your job will be to just review the results and then apply your experience about how exactly we can interpret those results so so when we apply a tool so for example a uh, tool like axiom tool like uh, uh, ftk sphere tools like in case in point investigator uh, they have been equipped uh, well enough to 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 parse the evidence in such a fashion through those databases and yes on files that uh, that becomes very easy for an investigator to understand what exactly contains in this browser what exactly is contained in this browser and what could be of some interest to my investigations right so to reiterate about uh, the very steps in initiating the browser forensics we do the imaging then we either extract the databases and the files or we just parse the image with the 
software which we have. But many times, since uh, the softwares are very expensive, if we do not have the software, that's the reason uh, that time we actually extract the databases ourselves manually. And then we do the investigations through freely available tools. Uh, let's just uh, have a look at them. All right. Uh, so we have some common browser artifacts which are there on your screen. I have further divided those artifacts into three categories. Category number one, the first to look artifacts in every single investigation, especially, uh, I mean, no matter whether it is industry uh, investigation or a law enforcement investigation, first of all, we search for any Google search history, any downloads and the navigation history. Navigation history basically is the history of browsing. Then, then for certain investigations, we also look for cookies or cache or bookmark. They have their own importance. Cookies, for example, it, it actually gives us a lot of data about the date and time, a uh, 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 lot of data about the session, session information as well. Cache basically gives us uh, some, uh, some artifacts related to the, the, the various resources which were downloaded into the into the local browser just to make the browsing faster and then the bookmarks of course uh, uh, again are uh, good to have in, uh, artifacts in some advanced cases then we also go for add-ons and form history so uh, my experience is that add-ons and extensions we only look for uh, when we uh, feel that there is some kind of there is some kind of infiltration, data exfiltration, uh, not infiltration, exfiltration. So data exfiltration, which has happened through one of those browser extensions. And then we go for their, how exactly the browser extension was written and so on and so forth. Form history, uh, when we, when we uh, do, a form, do, a, do a form fill in, next time it captures sort of those details already. And those details will be available into the form history form, form history uh, artifacts rather. These are some of the, common browser artifacts, which uh, is uh, normally done in any investigations uh, or rather most of the investigations. My point here, uh, when I, when I uh, uh, concurred for this uh, uh, presentation today, my point was that apart from these common browsing artifacts, can we have something else which can further, which can further help in our investigations? And then uh, we found that uh, one of the artifacts which is largely overlooked both by the industry uh, as well as by the law enforcement is something called the fake funds. And that is what uh, I, I wish to bring to the, the sky notice of this August gathering today that this Febicon, uh, rather the febicon.ico database, which is available into the artifacts folder of Google, Google Chrome, which is available here, Go user data default, Google Chrome user data default. We have a, we have a file called, we have a file called febicon.db, which actually contains a lot of, lot of uh, uh, interesting data. And before we go to the interesting data part, uh, let us understand what is a Febicon, by the way, yes. So Febicon basically says that it's a small icon which displays the tab of a web browser. So just to give you an example, just to give you an example, if Abhishek search for IESR, now Google make a search here, right? And when, we, when Google made a search, you see here in the tab part, there is a little Google icon, isn't it? This little Google icon now, this search, this search will be saved as one of the Febicons here, one of the Febicons. It says that when we visit a site for the first time, the browser builds the full URL, that is browser builds the entire URL like this, which also contains the search term, which also contains the search term. You can see here, right? Q is equal to IASR. That's the search term. Q, is, Q represents the query. The query is equal to IASR. And then what, ha what happens? Let's have, let's have a look. And downloads the icon, saving it locally on our device for future use. That is very important. And let's just quickly understand. Let's just quickly understand the, the, the specifics of this database. This database actually contains four tables. You can see this database, Fabicons.db, contains four different tables, which contains some very, 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 very important details. For example, the URL which was visited 
the page URL and the last time when the URL was visited here. Hmm. Now, why exactly I've been showing that? Because you might have been asking that uh, if at all, one of the common browser artifacts is the navigation history and which we do it all the time. Why exactly we should be looking into the Fabicon database, which more or less gives us the similar data. I mean, I'm browsing a website or I'm doing a Google search. The Google search is anyway getting stored into one of the other artifacts as well. Hmm. And so why do we need a Favicon database to look into? The simple answer is that many times it so happens that uh, it is very easy to delete my history. It is very easy to delete my history. I can just go and delete it. I can just go and delete whatever I want, huh? but we do not think of deleting the Fabicon database history because that remains into the database, even though the history might have been deleted. And that is what we have observed in many investigations that Fabicon actually provides us some detail, even though it is not very comprehensive, but at least it provides uh, some details about what kind of what kind of uh, 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 sites were visited by the by the person or the accused or the suspect or whatever. Okay, now. Two, I mean, two major, major contribution of Fabicon I wanted to highlight here. First, it can provide some useful information, especially in scenarios where the browser history has been deleted that I've already discussed. And second part is the timestamp. I, we just showed that there's a timestamp as well related to every single browsing, which has been reported into Fabicon database. The timestamp can actually provide us useful information about the sequence of browsing in what chronology the browsing really happened. So for example, Abhishek might have first searched for killing, killing my wife. And then he searched for what is the best way of killing my wife? Or then he searched for way of way, various ways of killing his wife. I mean, there are so many uh, different searches he might have done, but the, those all will be coming into the chronological order when we, when we go through the Fabicon databases, especially in cases where the browsing history has been deleted. So these are the two major contributions of Fabicons, uh, which uh, uh, I think uh, researchers or not researchers, but investigators, because it's a well-researched topic. Uh, many tools actually provide this information by default. For example, when we use Axiom, Axiom Examine 4.9, uh, it gives us Fabicon, de Fabicon uh, details uh, by default as one of its artifacts. All right. Uh, that is about Fabicons. Unfortunately, since there are so many participants, uh, it cannot be a you know two-way communication. I cannot just stop here and ask to uh, to uh, ask you to uh, uh, ask a question. So I'll have to go forward, and then maybe probably for the last five minutes we can go for the question and answer session. All right. Uh, the next part, the next thing uh, which I thought of highlighting today was another database called the login data dot DB. The login data. Dot db. So similarly, uh, what we have in favicon.db, in the same default folder, we have something called login data.db, which contains this table. There are basically two tables. One table is more famous, the table number this, which actually contains the login data of the person. So for example, if the person is logged in and then he has saved his password, this is the database where we get all the passwords. And once we have the passwords available with us, I mean, the passwords could be uh, stored in different form. We'll have to see which browser we have been using. Uh, once we have the password uh, and the various other artifacts which are available with the password as well. So for example, you see that uh, the password type, the password username, when exactly it was used for the time, the form data available with it. And you see here, the form data is into the blob and the password value is in the blob. So, so, so the restrictions are very less when it comes to storing the data. So you can have a lot of data inside these two, these two fields. So login data as well as Fabicons could be, could be uh, two of the fields to look into when it comes to browser forensics. Uh, before we go for the conclusion, before we go for the conclusion, I think I have another five minutes. Uh, let us just quickly go through the tool of analysis, an, an analysis of uh, these artifacts. So as I mentioned previously, as I mentioned previously, uh, when it comes to the automatic tools, then we have n number of tools. Favorites are like Axiom or in case endpoint investigator or TK suite. 
uh, they both they all have very good uh, interfaces for browsing invest browser inter investigation uh, there are many open source uh, tools as well my favorite is a tool called autopsy uh, which uh, uh, which uh, does some does some good work uh, when it comes to browser forensics and overall digital forensics as well uh, then uh, that's it uh, yes uh, the the main tool i want to discuss that is the sqlite browser the sqlite browser db browser for sqlite i mean this, this sqlite database uh, which uh, is the same database which we are talking about for google chrome uh, we can actually import the database here in this tool and then the the good part about this uh, tool is that we can write the sql queries as well we can write the sql queries on this tool to get multiple details multiple very good insight on it so just to give you an example here in the case of uh, febicons let me just yes uh, in the case of febicons you see here that the url is in column num uh, table number febicons and the time is in column number febicons bitmap so if you want both the url and the time what you need to do is to merge these two, two tables, Fabicons to bitmaps as well as the Fabicons table. And then you can, uh, 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 the, then we can find the time in one single, one single table. So, so SQLite browser actually provides this ability wherein we can write the SQL query to merge these two tables and get data, get details out of uh, uh, them as well. So with that, let us just have a quick conclusion. So obviously we know that uh, browser forensics is an important part of any, any investigations or incident response as we call it in the industry. And then we know that there are many common artifacts in every browser forensic exercises, but then there are two more artifacts to look upon when it comes to investigating uh, uh, anyone's computer and that is Webicons as well as Webicons.db and the second is uh, uh, logindata.db. That is what I wanted to highlight in this particular uh, session of mine. Thank you so much for giving me this wonderful opportunity.